So we'll be getting started um, for our working lunch. And again, the purpose of this next session is to have a little bit of a report back and synthesis of the discussions that happened when the working groups had breakouts yesterday. So for each of our working groups, there's two co-chairs and one of them will be coming up and giving a presentation. We will cut them off after 15 minutes, but they don't need to feel that they use the full time. Um, <laughs> and so first we're gonna have um, Lauren Trepanier from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where she's a professor in the Department of Medical Sciences and School of Veterinary Medicine, presenting on behalf of both her and Dr. Wen Hung Chung. Good afternoon. Um, I guess I would probably get parole if I it was in that position right now, right? So after lunch. <laughs> So I just want to summarize, hopefully accurately, um, what the first working group. The smoke mic is supposed to be working, but it's, it's not. It's coming in and out, so I'm taking it off. OK. So I want to summarize what the, now you can't see me behind the computer. I want to summarize what the uh, first uh, working group talked about yesterday, uh, focusing on basic research gaps. And I think that our, our uh, charge was similar to some of the other working groups, looking at key gaps in research knowledge, barriers to execution, maybe some out of the box or missing research perspectives, what additional genetic studies are needed, um, what's most ready for translation, um, resources, and then promising areas over the next five years. So as far as key gaps, um, the, one of the first we came up with was defining the cellular processes that lead to the development of drug neoantigens prior to MHC presentation, so trying to understand what drives drug to the MHC molecule that then it gets presented to the immune system. And we kept that purposefully broad, but in the meeting we talked about specific things that you would do to address that. The second would be characterizing how specific culture, culprit drugs activate immune responses outside of MHC restriction, because certainly MHC isn't everything. Uh, characterization of cofactors that drive immunogenicity, whether that's viral co-infection or um, uh, organ dysfunction that leads to high plasma concentrations, uh, or um, uh, metabolic polymorphisms that are maybe uh, a less of a, a driver but contribute uh, in the in the absence of MHC or or contribute to the presence of um, antigen presentation with the appropriate MHC allele. And then we talked a lot about validation of early diagnostic and prognostic markers at the first onset of clinical signs, and that, you know, because these are rare infection or rare uh, uh, diseases, you can't really get baseline uh, data on all patients that are treated. But the goal would be to have a, a strong surveillance system that where you could have um, collection of appropriate samples at, at very early in, in clinical onset before the skin is completely soft and things. You can actually get. Uh, maybe do immunohistochemistry, you can get appropriate PBMCs, perhaps urine and plasma samples, things like that, um, as well as DNA to try to find um, diagnostic and prognostic markers. And then because it's such a catastrophic disease, drug rechallenge, even though it's a gold standard for diagnosis for adverse drug reactions, it's not possible. So some reliable, confirmatory and safe in vitro challenge tests. And I think we all know what the barriers to execution are for rare diseases, um, especially ones that maybe have a complex phenotype is first of a critical mass of patients that are well phenotyped. We've talked about that a lot already. And then in order to, to get those patients and get appropriate phenotyping, you need to see them early. So you need a sentinel surveillance system that can catch patients early. And then appropriate biobank samples from early onset of disease. So not just DNA, but also potentially PBMCs and RNA later urine samples, plasma samples, um, uh, marginal biopsy samples that are going to give you good tissue for, um, for uh, histopathologic assessment. We talked a lot about animal models. Um, certainly they're lacking. Um, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm for jumping right in with them because we know that uh, many of these reactions are highly HLA related and animals obviously lack HLA restriction. Um, yes, you can humanize animals, but since there's other things going on besides 
HLA, those models may not be successful and initial attempts have not been successful. And so we, we sort of came to the consensus that animal models could be used to test specific pathways, but only after you understand the human phenotype better. Um, and so they, they should be used in a more narrow range rather than just saying, we're, we're going to try to reproduce this whole syndrome in, in animals. As far as missing research perspectives, um, um, one question was, are drugs being recognized in similar ways to viral antigens? You know, does, does viral co-infection trigger these reactions? Do these reactions trigger viral recrudescence? Um, and what is it about the epitopes that are being seen? Uh, do they, rec do they um, mimic or cross-react with viral antigens? And then the need to look just beyond T cells. So we know that, um, that these reactions are probably mediated by CD8 T cells. But what are the other players, NK cells, T regulatory cells, dendritic cells, and then lo looking at checkpoint blockade molecules to see um, if they are, are downregulated or upregulated in these patients. Um, we also talked about chemoinformatics, so looking at drugs that have been associated with TEN and looking at their structural motifs. And certainly this has been done for other drug hypersensitivities in general, but specifically for TEN and see if there's motifs that are in common um, or motifs that track, particularly with, particularly with um, certain HLA associations that might help with drug development as you go forward. And then we talked about additional genetic studies. We didn't spend a lot of time on this because there was a consensus that, yes, we need to look for more HLA associations because they're drug specific and they're ethnicity specific. Um, and so get a, a wider toolbox for uh, advising different populations. Uh, Oxcam type NSAIDs were high on everyone's list. Uh, Lamotrigine, of course, and then um, ingredients in cough medicines, which have been associated with TEN, particular ocular uh, complications, but it's not known which ingredients are actually important. And as far as most ready for translation, this is maybe a little disappointing, but we really, as far as translation in the next year or so, we really felt that predictive genetic testing is really the only thing ready for translation and is sort of already in translation. And that some of the other things that we talked about as far as targeting certain molecules like granulation and things uh, is just not ready for prime time yet. I think we all agree that we need um, an expanded consortium with international leadership. Um, the United States is, is I, sounds like we're behind the eight ball, and partially because we don't have single payer uh, um, health care that may be part of the problem, um, and our health care is very uh, fractionated. Uh, we talked about a public private funding model with shared responsibility from pharma, um, talking about not just the death of patients, but the death of drugs, so that there's, there's buy in from you know, the drug development side and the drug safety side, as well as from the physician patient side and from the FDA side. And this infrastructure needs to provide the ability to screen and biobank patients in the early onset phase and then an international registry of patients that has standardized phenotyping, ideally based on some of these early phase uh, biomarkers that could be developed and then molecular signatures within the, the biopsy itself. And these would provide the basis for adequately powered clinical trials. So what's promising over the next five years? Um, an investigation of differences between macular papular rash and SGSTEN as therapeutic targets, and Lars French is already working on this, sort of, you know, what are the triggers that take a benign course into a catastrophic course? And then biomarkers in the acute phase to facilitate diagnosis, so what are specific phenotypes? Um, uh, you know, obviously you need histopathology, but there may be subtypes or, or there may be markers, I mean, histochemistry or, or qPCR or other things within the biopsy that would allow you to clearly define uh, different subtypes. Um, using those biomarkers to then go back and look at, at prognosis, so who will progress, um, which patients need more intensive therapy, what are negative prognostic indicators. And then hopefully treatment targets. So if you know what's changing in real time in that acute setting, you may know what you need to target to check that, that fulminant reaction that's occurring. 
And I think in the, in the larger group, um, it was talked about massive parallel sequencing of HLAs linked to medical records outcomes. So you've got this background of, of genotyping that's already in place as you go forward, rather than trying to work backwards after the reaction occurs. And the, the buy-in for that is that, you know, the, as someone pointed out yesterday, these HLAs have relevance for many, many diseases, not just rare adverse drug outcomes. And so there, there should be a drive for that to happen. And then we also talked about predictive tests in addition to HLAs. So pathway analyses of GWAS data, which um, Munir talked about. Um, so not just looking at the high hit HLAs, but what's the collective impact of polymorphisms and say, you know, P450s, phase two enzymes, transporters, things that are going to affect the amount of drug that's actually available to adduct and or or associate non-covalently with an HLA. And then there's clear evidence that uh, plasma drug concentrations actually probably are important. You know, so we're we're sort of going back to metabolism again. And so again, in that acute phase when you're collecting samples, looking at urine, looking at plasma, when you still may have washout from the drug. Um, may help you understand whether there are uh, metabolic drivers as well as uh, HLA drivers. So I'll sit down and then open the floor for discussion. Open for questions. So there's a plethora of ideas and things to be done, <laughs> but a challenge, and we've heard that several times today, is, is funding this. Several, several of us ha are doing drug research, research on drug eruptions, uh, but have to run something else in the lab because it's just not sustainable. Working on rare patient data and getting publications out with one, within a year, and also the biobanking initiative going is not just from DNA, but you said RNA, fresh tissue, PBMCs, is, is, is a lot in it. And, and one question, I'm talking to Japanese, I don't know if there's any Japanese here, but um, yeah, there's, there's, they, they have a system from what I heard for, for TN, and I noted that down, where the, where the pharma companies contribute in, from the forefront out, a, a part of each medication for the sickness leave or long-term sickness leave and unemployment of the patients and also for research to some extent. In Switzerland, I don't know how it's here, but when you buy a, a MacBook Air, you pay when you buy already for the destruction and recuperation of bits of it. And um, I was yeah, wondering, when you were discussing from a FDA perspective, for you it's also an issue having good quality data to be able to make the label good, and that's going to come with financing if there's no way, if there's no way to try and yeah, get the companies to put a little a, a cent or two off every, every package of pills going into that. It's in their interest, it's in the interest of everyone from the front. Yeah, we had talked about that a fair amount, about public-private um, uh, cooperation. And um, so the various regulatory agencies, the various um, uh, research funding agencies at the various countries and their regulatory agencies, but also pharma. I mean, it, it, it seems like an obvious source of funds. And I, I'm not sure the lo logistics of making that happen in our political climate, but it, it seems mm -hmm. like that would be, have to be part of the puzzle. Because it's a pity they come running when they, in phase one or phase two, have a severe adverse eruption, and then, then they want to invest lots and really have results in a month. <coughs> That's not the way it's going to work. So, Cynthia, were you? Yeah, I was just going to ask if Taiwan could, because they have the Taiwan Relief Drug Relief Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit more? Uh, how how do the drug companies uh, contribute into that? Yeah, but unfortunately, most of the funding are uh, for the patient, not for research. Yeah, so far only uh, not so many funding uh, they, they can do for research purpose. So yeah, so but we did uh, raise some funding from the drug company uh, every year. So we get last uh, more than three million or four million U U.S. dollar per year. But uh, I I think in the future we can push the government to do some research from the foundation. Linear. <laughs> 
So we, we discussed this, and, and funding is crucial here for not only for initiation, but also for maintaining any resources that you have, as well as undertaking studies on the samples that you have with, with the new technologies which are coming through. And as you know, all those new technologies increase the cost of each experiment that you do. Um, but the majority of drugs that actually cause problems are generic, off-patent. Um, and, and so, therefore, this is not a problem just for pharma, it's actually a problem for healthcare, it's a problem for regulators. It's probably unlikely that one funding agency can fund all of this. And so, therefore, it is probably important to have a global consortium to be able to do this. So NIH working, for example, in the UK with Wellcome Trust, MRC, uh, with, with the Japanese so for funding agencies, etc. And that way, that may, that may be the only way to be able to lead some kind of sustainable funding in, in an area like this. Obviously, there may be some small areas uh, which may be uh, focused and so on, which could be funded by NIH, MRC, Wellcome Trust, etc. But 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 here, you know, uh, uh, in terms of a global uh, perspective, then one really needs to think about how one can develop, uh, get the funding in, but also maintain that resource that is developed from that. Okay. So, so maybe, you know, I think it would be uh, come as, as no surprise that, that people recognize the need for funding and that you're going to tell us that we should fund it. Um, I, I think it would be very helpful to, to spend our 15 minutes really kind of focusing on what is it um, and, and, you know, what, what are the high priority studies, what are the key needs, what are the things that are obstacles, as Lauren kind of, uh, you know, laid out for us, I think, very nicely. Uh, but, but in terms of a consensus of the group, where, where do you see the real pressure points where we could make some real progress? Neil? Okay. Well, since I was recognized by the chair before you said that, I just want to make a comment. Uh, I think puts it in some perspective, and the disclaimer is this will never happen here. In Sweden, there's no fault insurance that the manufacturers pay into, and in Japan, too, sort of that sort of description. In other words, if a patient has suffered harm from a drug or a vaccine, there's a central fund of money to help recognize that. And what it does is, it recognizes the physician who prescribed the drug can still talk to the patient. They don't have to run home and hide under the bed. They can keep their relationship with the patient going. They can initiate the patient's participation in that uh, fund to be a recipient. And if adjudicated, it's usually settled in about six months guaranteed. And it's not years and years and years of litigation hoping that you're going to win some big uh, lottery. Uh, so what it does is it keeps the patient-physician relationship there, collects wonderful data, funded by industry, no fault anywhere in the world. You can't go sue somewhere else. Um, you can see the obstacles here. It's actually it's intensely sensible. It's a good use of money, and extra money could be used for research. But if there's any lawyers watching, you, you, you're probably already calling your congressman saying, don't ever let this happen, and uh, because that's who would end up losing in the end is, uh, is the lawyers. So, so thank you, Neil. But I think I'm going to come back to Terry's point and and bring bring the question. And maybe I'll start with Wen Hung by just by asking you to chime in. You know, as you think about the items that came up, you know, if you wanted to pick your your top one, I know that's always a pressure thing to do from the discussion yesterday. What would you lead with? I think the most important uh, research issue we, sh we, sh we should do is uh, to get good sample, uh, biobanking of the sample, especially from the very early stage. So it's very uh, difficult because most of the sample we now we correct is suspected to to call the patient back to get the blood. But uh, if we were trying to find out the, the biomarker, the, the therapeutic target, we, we need some very early samples. That's, that's very, very difficult for for most of the, the, the researcher to, to do that. So I think we, we, we need to have a core hole and the perspective and the uh, or kind of the international consortium to collect the more simple size. Yeah, I think it's more, many, it should has many, many other people. And this is how we do, do that. I, th I think there's Sorry. some infrastructure here that you could just go forward and say, all right, this is, th these are the types of biomarkers that, that have promise for development. Uh, plasma proteomics, um, just uh, doing IHC, qPCR on biopsy samples, looking at PBMC cytotoxicity, things like that. These are the samples that we would need and focus funding on study those, uh, those kind of studies that are going to develop a bank of biomarkers uh, 
and you know the, the goal would be to have therapeutic targets because you're never going to eliminate the disease completely but if you have a good therapeutic target then you can at least you know decrease morbidity and mortality sir I, I think it would be uh, easier if we do it in a clinical trial of different interventions like a uh, because right now we do not have uh, exactly the efficacy data of various treatment options, IVIG, cyclosporine, corticosteroid. And if, if you run the trial in Taiwan, and then in that trial, you can get all the samples. Because uh, when we enroll the patient into the clinical trial interventions, is this, we need all the samples from them, right? And we, monitor, we can monitor them through uh, until uh, the, the final sequelae after the Stephen Tens uh, was treatment, either patient die or they have complications or so why. And in that case, we, we will be easier to get, I mean, the biomarkers if there is one. So I think a, a, a large clinical trial to test the efficacy of various options may be, may be good. Thank you. Mark? Yeah, uh, I just uh, carry on with that. I think a uh, clinical trial is good, but one of the things that struck me about the presentations yesterday is that the identification of the disease is, you know, probably way too late in terms of really looking at effective interventions. Uh, and this is not specifically related to the basic science group, but I think in terms of takeaways for today, this would relate to some of the things that we talked about in group three about surveillance and identifying early uh, markers of individuals that are uh, in an early stage of Stevens Johnson tens, uh, where and if we could in fact accomplish that, then that would I think support uh, a more effective enrollment in, into a clinical into an intervention trial. Yeah, I was actually just thinking the same thing, and I don't know if some of the people around the room who are who are really involved in this can talk about what you see as challenges of getting earlier onset identification of cases. Not. Mark. I wanted to follow up on actually what Mark had talked about yesterday, that the numbers are too small to actually get the cases of interest from a clinical trial, and also you get them too late. So by the time you get them, the thunderstorm has already happened. So you're just getting the, the, the footprint of what already has happened, which is a lot of different injury markers. They're not necessarily the harbingers. But what you can have, what was mentioned yesterday, is the Pos the patients who have the positive marker, for example, carbamazepine and that marker, 1502, the patients who don't get the reaction. And so you can look for markers of people who don't get a reaction and ask what in that mix of, um, you know, from a biological perspective might explain the protection effect. Um, you know, if, if you could, if you had an animal model, you could study for SJS, you could study it serially on a, on a, on a timeline from initiation of exposure and then every step of the way. But since you don't have that, which would then be ideal, then you could kind of find the early marker, the harbinger. But what you could do is look at individuals at a later point in the clinical trial who don't get a reaction or get a, min a minor skin reaction who have some adaptation. Lars? So if I had to choose from all um, I think it's, it's pretty clear that it's immunologically driven. It's pretty clear also that some of the patients who have a defined HLA, which is a risk factor, some of them, despite that, uh, won't develop the disease, so a cofactor is needed. And I think research for that cofactor would be really important. If we could target that, we would have a, a lower incidence and we'd maybe be able to turn it off. HIV is a cofactor, and ampicillin EBV is a cofactor, so there's some evidence it may be a, a pathogen, it may be signaling through innate pathways, and I think that's really something that's been under-researched and where it has to be looked at. And do you think the appropriate time to look at that is, is <clears throat> as the early surveillance and when reactions ramping up or before the patient is treated? Yeah, I think we have to really get as much uh, samples as we can, our, our early samples, PBMC and, and skin samples, and then run them with the, with the techniques, beautiful techniques we have to try and get leads. Uh, 
but there's quite some in, in vitro stuff you can do too uh, with hypothesis driven and not non biased, really, hypothesis driven on PBMCs or on mixtures of PBMCs and keratinocytes. And some of this you may be able to do uh, by having the patients, you knowing the patients and going back to them six months afterwards and getting the PBMCs and getting keratinocytes from hair follicles or from biopsy, putting them in culture and working with this, we know that we can do the lymphocyte transformation tests a few months after, and that works in those patients that survive. So the, it's, it's not only the acute phase, it's getting material also later on for in vitro. I, I think regardless, the fundamental um, infrastructure is needed, and the capacity uh, building is going to be key. And I think what maybe differentiates this from other initiatives is the need for broad international collaboration to get the cases. And I would be interested from Terry and others in terms of within the uh, within the NIH framework and FDA framework, and you know maybe broad co collaboration across across not just uh, not just the NIH but other FDA other regulatory agencies internationally, given the um, the international presence here and the need for for international collaborations, are there ways to actually facilitate that or make that happen? Well, sure. I mean, NIH does. We probably fund more research internationally than, than any other um, funding body uh, uh, funds outside of their country. So, so there's a, and there are many good examples of collaborative projects that we've done, as, as Munir mentioned, with the Wellcome Trust and the MRC and, and uh, you know, a whole variety of other agencies. So I think that, you know, the, the bigger question may be how would one sustain such an effort? Because one of the challenges in the area of drug safety is that it never goes away. Um, and, and once you get started, Started down that that road, which is a, you know an important road to, to start down. Uh, it's not clear that that the research agencies can sustain that effort. So so are there ways then to work with other agencies? And we've talked about a few of them here today in terms of the of the U.S. the, the CDC, you know, our Centers for Disease Control, our, our um, uh, Agency for Research Health and, and Quality, um, and you know those may be agencies that could pick up some of these efforts uh, down the road. But uh, but I think again, first rather than than perhaps sort of figuring out who's going to fund this and how we make it funded, we need to define what the what is. Um, so, so if an international collaboration is something that sounds like everybody is enthusiastic about, what are the key things this international collaboration would do, and how is it different from those that already exist? Biobanking is, is sort of the fundamental sort of first step, is getting, getting samples that aren't currently being collected, which includes PBMCs, which is not, and, and tissue, and um, you know, so there's been a lot of work on getting DNA and DNA banks, but I think we need to broaden our repertoire of um, samples that are being collected. So, you know, DNA, RNA, serum, plasma, cells. Okay. So Munir and then Lars. So um, you, we've heard that so many people have biobanks um, and collections already. I guess the question that you asked, Terry, is what is it? What's different? I think scale, and upscale what we do, and and and, and tremendously increase the scale of what we do by this global collaboration. That's number one in terms of difference. I think in terms of key factors that we need to look at, we need to look at the predictive biomarkers, the diagnostic and prognostic biomarkers, and key for that, particularly for the latter two, will be identifying patients early. Now that is a challenge. Um, and you'll have lots of false positives, but having to uh, getting those patients identified early, as was stated earlier today, and we discussed that extensively yesterday, will allow you to be able to identify those kind of diagnostic biomarkers, which allows then to be able to undertake stratified trials in smaller numbers of patients, which you, you, you at the moment you can't do because it's such a rare disease. So undertaking trial in this area is going to be in, in, immensely difficult. So, so, you know, having those kind of uh, uh, early markers which allow you to be able to stratify and to take kind of Bayesian type trials um, will be the only way to be able to then uh, really test some of the therapeutic interventions. Lars? I just wanted to add on to these two comments. The biobanking can't go, in my opinion, without a registry. And uh, that's, uh, as we discussed before, with well phenotyped cases so that you can have the clinical data to it. And then one big element, if we have to have an alliance to together, is talk the same language. So harmonization for, for the, the clinical characteristics we're bringing in, the, in, in our registry. 
so that we can really exchange well. Yeah, and I think part of that is also thinking about expanding to areas with high numbers of cases that don't have the infrastructure in place yet. And, some, and so sort of both retrospectively putting together groups that are working and then thinking about how to best move forward into new areas as well. Steve, and then we're going to move on to the next group. Well, I think together with the um, early identification with patients and collect, collection of um, biomedical samples, whether it's um, um, plasma or cellular materials, there needs to be um, um, centers that can receive them and work on different parts of, touch different parts of the elephant. And so um, uh, Lauren and her summary of what their group did identified, you know, the various <coughs> steps between drug administration, drug bioactivation, um, processing of the neoantigens all the way through to the immune response. Probably you're looking at four or five specialized centers that can um, work on each, um, each of the components that might be involved. But there also needs to be a way of um, sending, um, you know, peripheral blood mononuclear cells from Kansas City, Missouri to um, um, Switzerland or wherever that aspect of the big picture is going to be uh, worked upon. And so I think uh, there, there's a lot of elements uh, uh, towards making this happen that would have to be uh, worked out as well. Great. Very good point. Thank you. So we're going to turn over now to the report back from working group two. Um, <laughs> I don't know if, if Howard or Sirukabeth is going to the podium. 